J-O-Y. J comes first, then O, then Y. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. So that's just another way to look at the word. However, uh, I want to um, present to you this subject this afternoon because I do believe it's, it's a crucial thing that m many of us are missing in our lives. And uh, just as I'm missing this at the moment. There we are. Now, joy, in the different ways it's given in the Bible, is mentioned at least 214 times. So it must be an important subject. What do you think? Okay. Now, I'll get used to this. Uh, here's one from Isaiah, and it says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. A lot of people get the idea that the Christian life is, is one of austerity and there's, there's not a lot of joy in it. But the scripture says the opposite. That in Jesus there's a tremendous amount of joy. It's not a lot of restrictions that make you feel bad and uncomfortable because everything he tells us to do is for our safety, our well-being and our happiness. And uh, the Ten Commandments. Most people think, oh, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. But if you stay inside the boundary of the Ten Commandments, you'll have tremendous happiness in your life, more than you realise. And our brother this morning was talking about uh, touching on that to some degree, that uh, these restrictions are actually safety barriers. When people outside the safety barrier are hurting so much, you can, inside that barrier, because you're obedient to it, be showing tremendous joy to everyone around you, no matter what happens. Okay. Now, here's another one from Isaiah. Mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. And that's speaking of the new earth, of course, when um, there's no more death or sorrow or crying and, and death doesn't snatch you away from something you've just made that you like. But everything you do, you'll be able to enjoy for a long, 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 long time with no regrets. Isn't that wonderful? Here's another one, this time from the book of Job. If they obey and serve him, they shall soon, I'm sorry, they shall spend the days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. So the, the Bible is telling us that following the way of the Lord brings joy and pleasure and for a long, long time, a time actually that will never end. And now in Ecclesiastes, God giveth to a man that which is good in his sight, wisdom and knowledge and joy. And here's another one from John. We could just keep on going. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again and your, joy, your heart shall rejoice and your joy no man taketh from you. So it doesn't matter how people treat you, if they curse you and swear at you and buffet you, you simply smile at them and say, God bless you, brother or sister, I love you. And you can have a smile back at them. And uh, long-suffering, goodness, joy, the fruits of the Spirit include joy. Joy is put after love. Love comes first and followed by joy. Another one, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13. But rejoice, inasmuch ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. So when we suffer, friends, just count that as a bond with, between you and your Saviour. What did he do? He came right down here and suffered the most, didn't he? So if you suffer, it's nothing compared with what he's been through. And you can rejoice in that. 
that it draws you closer to him, that it, if you have the mind of Jesus, you can actually enjoy the suffering because there is something better coming and you are showing those around you that there is a better way. And your joy will increase as you represent your Saviour and let his light and love shine through you. What a privilege this is. And as ye are partakers of the sufferings of Jesus, so shall ye also be of the consolation. Now what made Jesus come down here to earth and suffer for us when he didn't have to? Yes, loved us. And he, and he looked ahead beyond the cross and he saw the tremendous joy of saved people who were going to be around him for eternity. People that otherwise would have been lost forever. Because he came down and suffered and he died, he could see the results of his suffering would be worthwhile. Oh, how wonderful. And Jesus, when he was talking to his disciples, he said, these things have I spoken to you, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Now, the purpose of the Bible is to bring us joy. Joy now while we wait for eternal life and joy etern eternally. And the whole purpose of Jesus coming down was to bring joy back into the hearts of the universe that had been marred by sin. And Jesus' act of suffering has made it possible for us to join in with him in the rejoicing of the new earth. And you know, friends, I'm looking forward very, very much. Very much. And it's in my prayers all the time now. It never used to be, but now I'm concentrating a lot more on it, thanking him that uh, he has gone through that for me and rejoicing and praising him that I will have an opportunity very soon when we all go home together we'll have an opportunity to listen to the testimonies of all the other saved people the wonderful things God did in their lives and I'm going I want to add my testimonies too do you know what I'm encouraging everybody I meet now to get a little notebook and people who whom I worship with on Sabbaths uh, we, we, we talk about this quite a lot actually a Sabbath never goes by without praising God and sharing testimonies. And that should be a big part of our worship. And uh, I'm looking forward very much to doing that in heaven because that's going to be an increasing joy all the time. And I'm encouraging people now to buy a notebook, sit down and start writing down little stories or, or the titles of little stories that you can remember in your own personal life from as early in life that you can remember God's intervention and write down these lovely little things that happened that you know happened because God intervened in your life. Isn't that worth doing? And uh, Josephine and I have been doing this now for two or three years and we've got huge books full of, of stories and testimonies. I could spend all day just telling the wonderful things God has done in my life. Tell story after story after story after story and some of them seem impossible. But they do remind us that uh, God has been speaking to us sometimes and we've heard his voice and, and not recognised it as his voice but when we followed that, wonderful thing followed. God does speak to us. He speaks to all of us. And uh, we just got to remember these things and recognise them and, and think about them and share them with other people. This is what God wants us to do. And that's why the scripture was given to share God's wonders, the wonders of his love. Looking unto Jesus, the beginner and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of the majesty of God. Because that joy of future deliverance of those that he, he died for, because of that joy that he could look forward into the future and see happening, it was worth it to him 
He was willing to go to the cross because he looked forward to the result of it. That's what this is talking about. Joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. And the most happy and joyful person in the universe is going to be Jesus Christ himself. And uh, we're going to be so happy as we see the redeemed. Maybe people we thought would never be in heaven because our influence, our way of life, was so different from the world that they were drawn to Jesus because of, of knowing us. And we may never know the results until we get there and we see them. Isn't that going to be wonderful? All those surprises. All right. Now, here is another one from John chapter 10, verse 10. I came that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, you can just live and be miserable all the time. That's just, it's a, like a living death and it's not enjoyable. But if you can have the same life and be more abundant, more abundant, joy, 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 joy all the time, some people may get, may get annoyed that you're so happy. <laughs> but others will be so glad because you're a much nicer person to know. Okay. Now, this tells us we are light bearers reflecting God's character. Our character should be such that others will get a true picture of Jesus. Now, in the book uh, Steps to Christ, which we have for family worship every morning, we just read a little paragraph and, and think about it and, and, and then pray and thank the Lord. That book actually is, outside the Bible, I think is the most beautiful book ever written. Steps to Christ. And the modern version is sometimes called Ways to Happiness. Well, it means the same thing. The closer you get to Jesus, the happier you can be. And you know, the way m many of us Christians go on and grumble and complain and worry about things that we don't have to, of course those things may be important, but rejoice while we have those troubles. And if somebody uh, misunderstands us and treats us roughly, then praise God that you can still be happy toward them and make their life change. And uh, in that little book, we are told many beautiful things about uh, the joy of, of being, of being uh, a follower of Jesus. So many people get the wrong idea of what a Christian is because we look grumpy, we talk grumpy, we, we get upset easily, we, we shout and scream, we, we get impatient and so on. And that's not how it should be. Be happy. If somebody curses you, love them. Jesus says that's like casting coals of fire on their head. It'll shock them. Just love them. Be happy all the time and you'll be surprised what effect that's going to have upon people. All right? Uh, and she talks about uh, she had a dream of uh, walking through a garden and here was the owner of the garden showing all the beautiful flowers. And as they walked through, the, uh, another person came up and started complaining about the thorns on the thorn bushes that were not beside the road where the beautiful flowers were but were behind the flowers and said, what a, what a shame these terrible thorns are in this garden. And then she goes on to say, but look at the flowers. How beautiful they are. They overshadow the thorns. Don't focus on the thorns, focus on the flowers. And that's a wonderful piece of advice, isn't it? And then we give a better, a better um, example to people of what Jesus is like. Because if they know that we're Christians, they know that we're Seventh-day Adventists, those people are going to be watching us. We heard that in the sermon this morning. They're going to be watching us to see what kind of witness we're giving. Is being a Christian making us a happier person? Is it making us a kinder person? Is it making us a more trustworthy person? Is it making us a more joyful person? And if we 
do not focus on the sad things. Focus on the happy things. Your joy is going to be abundant. And you can have this now before we get to heaven simply by focusing on the lovely, not the unlovely. And uh, husbands and wives, if, you, if your wife has offended you or your husband has offended you, don't hold that grudge and, and then say, I'm going to get back at them. No, no, no. Show joy and enjoy living there. And you'd be surprised how it'll cheer up your partner as well. And life becomes happier for both of you. All right. Now, it is uh, no secret that uh, if we do represent Christ, we shall make his service more attractive because the service of Jesus, a ser being a servant of him, is a very attractive thing. It's a great honour. Okay. And uh, she says this. This is, this is a quote from uh, Steps to Christ. Christians who gather up gloom and sadness and murmur and complain are giving others a false representation of God and the Christian life. So it's a pretty serious matter, isn't it? We have a responsibility to represent God correctly and not misrepresent him to people because they're looking at us to see what God is like, whether you know it or not. Okay, and she goes on to say, they give the impression that God is not pleased to have his children happy and in this they bear false witness against our Heavenly Father. My, do you realise how, how serious a matter this is? Our moods are bearing false witness against our Heavenly Father. Do we love him? Do we know that he loves us? What kind of witness are we giving to others by our example? All right, so one very important thing is when things keep going wrong, what should we do? Focus on the positive. Yep. Okay. And we have uh, this beautiful uh, piece of advice from Philippians. I think we all know it. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, if there be, and whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. The more you think of things, the more like those things you become. Praise ye the Lord. Happy is he that hath the Lord. The book of Psalms actually is almost full of nothing else but praise to God if you go through it. Now in Psalms again, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And do you know the kind of prayer that God is going to answer before anything else? It's the prayer that starts off with praise. You just don't get down on your knees and, and start your prayer by complaining or by asking God to do, 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 do these things. No, you start praising him. And he opens up his ear to See how much he can do for you. Believe me, that is effective prayer. And that's, Jesus gave us an example of that at the tomb of Lazarus when everybody was crying and complaining about Lazarus and he was dead. And Jesus, if you'd come earlier, he might not have died. Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Oh, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Then he said, Lazarus, come forth. So what did he do? He thanked the Father first and then the prayer was answered. God is so good. Okay. Now here is another one from uh, the book of Exodus. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love 
and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. That is God's character. So let's praise him. Keep praising him. Never stop praising God. And I find myself now, dear friends, more than ever wanting to praise God throughout every day. And I have a lot of sad things happen around me. And immediately that happens to me. I say, God, thank you for helping me overcome this. Thank you for helping me reveal your character. And things start improving, believe me. Okay. We're told in the book of Psalms that God inhabits the praises of his people. In other words, the praises, praises and praises and praises is where God is going to send his ear, listening. He's going to inhabit your praises and live in them. Now you remember the story of Jehoshaphat. The enemy had come in a great mass and they were overwhelming in their numbers and it looked like Jerusalem was going to be attacked and destroyed. And Jehoshaphat, a godly king, he arranged, you wouldn't believe, it, this is a weird kind of military campaign, he arranged for singers to go out, not a battle of, of, of Israeli soldiers, but a group of singers to go out into the battle area, just outside the city before the fighting began, and they started singing and praising God for the victory. And the battle hadn't even started. And you know what that did to the enemy? They panicked and started fighting each other. They thought, what do they know that we don't know? And they got scared. <laughs> Just because the army of Israel was praising God, God confused the enemy and the battle was lost. The enemy was routed. The praises of God's people opened up the change of circumstances. And uh, there, there's the story. He appointed singers unto the Lord that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the enemy and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. That's what the Bible tells us. And that is a most unusual way of winning a battle, isn't it? Praise God and the enemy collapses. And that's what he did. And uh, here in the, the same book it says, when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord sent ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten, and every one helped destroy another. Great battle strategy. And you know, uh, over in America, they, they have a, uh, a military academy and uh, the president of the military academy uh, related that uh, when they uh, teach the, the students battle techniques that will win the war, they study German techniques, British, American, uh, Asian, African, and they study these in the academy so that the, uh, the army uh, personnel learn these battle techniques that have won battles in the past. But there's one country that they have never studied for that, and that is the history of ancient Israel. And the reason the president of the academy gave that they don't teach that is because all those battles were won by God. That's an official statement from this American, I think it's uh, West Point, Military Academy in America. Okay, when God's people take note of what the Lord is telling them, they have great reason to rejoice and praise him. All right. And this is this. David said, seven times a day will I praise thee. Now seven is a symbol of perfection and completeness. And when God does something seven times, he does, it means he's doing it completely and fully. 
and he's telling us to do something seven times, he's telling us to keep on praising. Don't stop. Keep on doing it. Okay. And uh, he, David also says, at all times I will praise God. So th that's what it means. Seven times a day means at all times because seven completes the day. All right. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, most of David's psalms have more to say about praising God than anything else. Uh, here we come to the book of Hebrews. Offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Fear and the first angel's message, which we had this morning in the sermon too. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Give glory to God. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, we are told. Be so offering praise is part of the three angels' messages. Isn't that interesting? If we're going to live the three angels' messages, it will involve praising God. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. So what's better than life? God's wonderful love. And for that reason, we've got every uh, excuse to praise him. Okay. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Okay. And you might not feel like praising God, but do it anyway. Fake it until you make it. I, I like that expression. And or another one is, do the motions until you get the emotions <laughs> and they will come. Okay. Now, a dear friend of ours, uh, we, we often speak to him on the, on the phone and we email each other, lives in India. He used to be a Muslim. Paul Sinaraj actually became a Christian and God has done wonderful things for him. And he keeps sharing with us wonderful events that took place and a couple of years ago i'm going to tell you a story that happened a couple of years ago in april on april the 7th they had a big baptism in the uh, arabian sea which fronts on the west coast of india and while they were there they were attacked by militant muslims with big iron bars and uh, paul's head was cracked and badly smashed and he was rushed to a hospital and they thought they could not do anything for him. So he was then rushed to an emergency hospital and the uh, assailants who had attacked them at the baptism uh, heard that he was at that hospital. They had scouts searching around because they wanted to finish him off. And so he was quickly whisked out of the hospital to a secret house in the bush, not too far away, that was lived in by one of his friends, also a secret Christian. That man and his wife had two little children, less than four years old, and an elderly mother. And uh, t t when Paul was rushed to that house, uh, two more friends were brought in to help look after him. And... Uh, he was there for three weeks and eventually the uh, Muslim uh, terrorists watching the comings and goings were different from usual in that area. They saw these people who were coming in and out and they were actually coming in and out to worship and pray and visit him. And so a group of uh, terrorists came into the forest and uh, they got ready for the attack to slaughter these, these eight people in the house. And the little children started crying. And, uh, the, and one of the, the, the ladies there who'd come in to look, help look after him was pregnant seven months. And so she was trembling too and they were all afraid and they thought this is going to be our last day. 
these people are coming with their weapons to kill us off in this house and we're trapped here. So do you know what they did? I've got the testimony, in fact I've got it in the car, written word for word by him as he sent, as he sent this to us later. He said, we all joined hands knowing that this was our last day alive because we were about to be slaughtered and we started praising God for his goodness and his love and for rescuing us from sin. And we started praising him and singing praises to him together. And you know what happened? Immediately, a lion came roaring out of the forest and, and attacked one of the terrorists and seized him by the throat. The terrorists were in the trees there and they were joining hands and they were praising God and the lion came and attacked one of those men. And they tried to fight him off but two other lions came out and attacked them also so they all started running out of the forest. And everybody in that house was safe from further attack. Isn't that wonderful? What was the difference? They were praising God. Now, an interesting thing was that in India, there's no lions. Now, at creation, when God spoke and it was done, what did he do? He spoke these things into existence for the purpose, didn't he? I wonder if God did the same again. In 2017, April 2017, April the 27th, did he create the lions especially to, ter ter to terrorise the terrorists? Because lions have never been seen in that area, ever, in history. But three lions came out and chased them away when, they st when the people of God started praising him. Oh, isn't God wonderful? Yeah. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, Josephine was in Hawaii. I'm sure she won't mind me telling this story. She was in Hawaii a few years ago, and she met a lady, actually, that uh, what the doctor had said that she had cancer behind the eye and that to get rid of the cancer, he'd have to take out her eye. Not a very nice solution. And so she was worried. She didn't know what to do. Should she go ahead with the operation or, or would it be, would her life be miserable after that when she became blind? And so Josephine spoke to her and said, give it, I think it was three weeks. Uh, give it three weeks. Don't go to the doctor yet. Start praising God. Praise him for your hands, that you can wash the dishes, that you can tend the garden, that you can hug your husband, hug your children. Start praising him for your eyes. Start praising him for your legs, that you're mobile, you can do, do things. Start praising him for your husband, that he doesn't go out with other women and again vanting around when you want him to be home with you. Each day start praising God for something different and praise him right through the day. And do you know that woman at the end of that period of time went to her doctor and do you know what he said? You do not need an operation anymore. Cancer. The lady had much to praise God for, didn't she? Praising. God can work miracles. The joy of the Lord shall be your strength. And then it says, A merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Do you know, friends, that this is medically true as well as spiritually so? It's now known that uh, when you are sick, the bones release stem cells into the bloodstream and they're like little fish that go swimming through the bloodstream listening for cries of help for if it's a heart problem the, the the sick cells of the heart are crying out for help these little stem cells leave the bloodstream 
gravitate to the heart and s turn themselves into heart, uh, new heart cells to replace the sick ones. Do you know this is a, a newly discovered science that this is done by the body and so now there is a company that actually produces something to wake up the, the bones to release more stem cells and keep on releasing more stem cells and people are getting well from all sorts of things that they previously had to have operations for. Isn't that wonderful? And it's released from the bones. So a happy heart is good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. So health comes from the bones. Good. All right. So that's just a, a diagram of how from the bones the stem cells are created that go to various parts of the body to help repair those parts of the body. And you know, when, um, when children are sick, they usually recover faster than older people. Isn't that right? Because the, the reason is the stem cell release from the bones slows down as we get older. And so the, 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 this company actually is now uh, doing something that activates the, the, bone, the bones for to produce more stem cells like they had when they were children. So that the recovery is, uh, is more uh, realistic for an older person than it used to be. Okay, now sing. We're told to sing in the scriptures. Let's have a look at this. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. And so the first angel's message, give glory to God, can encompass happy singing, thanking God, songs of praise. And so it's no accident that we have songs of praise when we have a meeting. Now, in the book of Psalms, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and he hath, and his truth endures to all generations. Dear friends, I think we need this subject. We need this, our focus to be on God and how wonderful he is. God is ready to help us and if we start praising him, we'll find the help is faster. Okay, in all of our troubles, whatever they be, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Now, what about giving others joy? Okay, Jesus first, others second, yourself last. But giving joy to other people. And uh, take an interest in everybody except yourself. Too many of us start saying, poor me, poor me, poor me. So ask yourself two questions here. Have I added to the joy of another today? Have I subtracted from somebody's pain? And that should be the mark of a successful day. Every day can be like that. When Satan came down and hijacked this planet, Jesus came down to show us how we could bring joy to others. He descended to the lowest of the low, the outcasts of society, and he showed them that God loved them. And uh, Jesus said, I give to them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now, I like that text. No one can pluck you out of Jesus' hand except you let it happen. Jesus has all power and all desire to hold you tight. Now, a few years ago, this little boy went swimming in the pool just in front of his, his, uh, his mother's home. And she was watching the dishes and looking out of the window and she saw him ju jumping into the water and starting to splash around in the water. And then her heart leapt with fear. She saw in the water a crocodile 
I think actually it was an alligator, that's what they call them over there. This alligator had also seen the boy and was making a beeline to the boy to seize him. She dropped everything. She rushed out of the house and she got down just as he came. to. She was shouting out to him and as she got to the edge of the, of the pool, she started seizing him with her hands just as an alligator seized his legs with, with its mouth. So began the tug of war between the alligator, huge and, and very heavy and strong, and the mother. And the tugging continued. And uh, suddenly, as they were screaming, the uh, passing farmer saw it in his, by his car beside the road and he, he stopped the car, he got out, he had a gun with him and he shot the alligator dead and it released its grip. And later on, this boy was uh, interviewed on television and they wanted, to, uh, him, they wanted him to show the marks of the alligator on his legs. So he showed them the marks of the alligator. But then he said to them, but I really want to show you the marks of love from my mother. Look at my arms. Because she had dug in her, 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 her nails into his arm in the spring to pull him. And he said, those were, these are my marks of love. I love these marks, not those ones. And dear friends, that's what Jesus has done for us. Now, this is what the boy actually said. These were his actual words recorded. But look at my arms. I have great scars on my arms too. I have them because my mum would not let go. And what are we told about Jesus? Satan is, is pulling us. What does Jesus do? He holds on to us. We may go through traumas and sufferings and be wounded by it because of this tussle between Christ and Satan, but Jesus is allowing us to have these wounds because these wounds are because of his love that he will not let us go. And he, he wants us to go through this trauma because he wants to pull us out from the enemy. And um, you and I can identify with that, can't we? Sure we can. Some of those scars are, in our lives are unsightly and uh, they're unpleasant and they cause us a lot of regret because the, our way of life made the, the, the struggle necessary and in that struggle we were wounded because Jesus would not let go. Scars of love. He's been holding on to you. If he let you go, you can go out into the world and have no troubles. Because he's not letting you go, you're having troubles. Because there's a fight going on for you between him and Satan. Jesus has promised, I will not let you go. No man can snatch you out of my hand. So we've got every reason to be joyful. Thank God for the sufferings we go through because Jesus will not let us go. He loves you too much. God bless you. Shall we just uh, <coughs> close our eyes in prayer? Loving Father, we thank you for the, your love that does not let us go. We want you to hold on to us, Lord. We want you to give us joy in the fact that there is a wonderful God who loves us, a heavenly Father and his dear Son, Jesus, and that you've adopted us into your family and you don't want to let us go. And we look forward to the day when we all get into heaven and we praise you and we join in the praises of others and we hear their praises and their stories and uh, we get to know you better every day and every day we'll get to love you better. The better we know you, the better we'll love you. And the more we love you, the greater our joy is going to be throughout eternity. It will never stop. And dear Father, I want everyone who's here today to be part of that wonderful rejoicing that gets better and better and better as the eternity goes by. Please hold us all tight, dear Father. 
We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.